Well, good morning. Very warm welcome to each and every one of you. What a joy it is to gather in God's house today on this beautiful day he's given to us, another Lord's Day, another beginning of a, a week that he has laid before us, uh, and just such an opportunity to gather together as God's people. I want to say a, a very special welcome to any family and friends of Nate and Sherry that are here with us today as we anticipate a baptism just a little bit later on in the service this morning. And we're very excited about that to once again celebrate God's covenant faithfulness and his grace to us, his people, who are so undeserving and yet so loved by our great God. So we have a lot in worship today. We're excited to be here, and we want to worship together. God wants to greet us as we do that and invite you to stand to receive that greeting. You know, the psalmist says in Psalm 48, the very opening words of that passage, Great is the Lord and most worthy to be praised. So as God greets us this morning, as we enter into this time, let's keep that in the forefront of our mind and our heart, that our God is worthy to be praised. God greets his people this morning with these words, Grace, mercy, and peace be to you. From God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's lift our voices in song and praise to God.
Would you pray with me? God, we are so thankful for this day that you have blessed us with, that you've woken us up and you've helped us roll out of bed, perhaps stumble a bit into the shower and get ready for the day. God, to start that day with you, to gather with your people and to celebrate your faithful love to us, your children. To stand and say, you and you alone, O oh God, are worthy of our worship. That you, Lord Jesus Christ, are everything to us. That without you, we'd be nothing. We'd be lost. But with you, we have everything. And that because of your grace. So, Father, as we worship today, and, and we look forward, God, to this worship, to the opportunity to 
to witness together of baptism, to listen to your word, to sing our praises, to offer our gifts as we worship today. Father, may we worship, may we worship from hearts that are true and sincere. God, that want to, want to love you with all that we are. So we give this time to you. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we do have the very special opportunity to celebrate another sacrament. So last Sunday, of course, we celebrated the sacrament of communion. And today we get to celebrate together the sacrament of baptism. Little Everett Anderson Wind, the newest addition uh, for Nate and Sherry. As we begin thinking about baptism and what this is all about, I want to read just a, a few questions and answers from our Heidelberg Catechism, just to remind us uh, again what this is all about. I want to begin with this question, what are sacraments? Sacraments are holy signs and seals for us to see. They were instituted by God so that by our use of them, he might make us understand more clearly the promise of the gospel, and might put his seal on that promise. And this is God's gospel promise, namely to forgive our sins and give us eternal life by grace alone because of Christ's one sacrifice finished on the cross. The next question, are both the word and the sacraments then intended to focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross as our only ground of salvation? Absolutely right. In the gospel, the Holy Spirit teaches us and that through the holy sacraments, he assures us that our entire salvation rests on Christ's one sacrifice for us on the cross. Well, how does baptism remind you and assure you that Christ's one sacrifice on the cross is for you personally? In this way, Christ instituted this outward washing and with it gave the promise that as surely as water washes away dirt from the body, so certainly his blood and his spirit wash away my soul's impurity. In other words, all my sins. But what does it mean to be washed with Christ's blood and spirit? Well, to be washed with Christ's blood means that God, by grace, has forgiven my sins because of Christ's blood poured out for me in his sacrifice on the cross. And to be washed with Christ's spirit means that the Holy Spirit has renewed me and set me apart to be a member of Christ so that more and more I become dead to sin and increasingly live a holy and blameless life. Now, does this outward washing with water itself wash away sins? No. Only Jesus Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit cleanse us from all sins. Well, why then does the Holy Spirit call baptism the washing of rebirth and the washing away of sins? God has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that the blood and spirit of Christ wash away our sins just as water washes away dirt from our bodies. But more important, he wants to assure us by this divine pledge and sign that the washing away of our sins spiritually is as real as physical washing with water. And finally, should infants, too, be baptized? Yes, infants as well as adults are in God's covenant and are his people. They, no less than adults, are promised the forgiveness of sin through Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit who produces faith. Therefore, by baptism, the mark of the covenant, infants should be received into the Christian church and should be distinguished from the children of unbelievers. This was done in the Old Testament by circumcision, which was replaced in the New Testament by baptism. Well, Nate and Sherry, since you are presenting Everett for this sacrament this morning, I'd like to ask you to stand right where you are. And I've got a few questions uh, I'm going to ask you to answer in front of God and his people. First of all this, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, accept the promises of God, and affirm the truth of the Christian faith, which is proclaimed in the Bible and confessed in this Church of Christ? Second, do you believe that Everett, though sinful by nature, 
is received by God in Christ as a member of his covenant and therefore ought to be baptized. And finally, third, do you promise in reliance on the Holy Spirit and with the help of the Christian community to do all in your power to instruct Everett in the Christian faith and to lead him by your example to be a disciple of Christ? Nate and Sherry, how do you answer I'd like to invite uh, all of you to stand alongside of Nate and Sherry, and I have a question for all of us. And following this question, the affirmative answer is, we do, God helping us. Here's the question. Do you, the people of the Lord, promise to receive Everett in love, to pray for him, to help instruct him in the faith, and encourage and sustain him in the fellowship of believers. Congregation, how do we respond? We do. God helping us. Thank you. Congregation, you may be seated. and You guys can come on up. And along with, uh, I believe, someone you, you recognize as an elder. All right, come on over here. And Mitch is going to be our, our elder here today. Everybody see? All right, you can see. Good, good. Well, our Lord said, let the little children come to me, and don't hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Everett Anderson Wind, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Nate and Sherry, we're just absolutely thrilled for what we are witnessing here today. As God has blessed you with another child, as he's growing your family, and I know certainly your family is excited about that, there's no doubt. But, you know, your church family is excited about that, too. And just to see God's grace and his faithfulness continuing to work in your lives, certainly in the life of this little one, and in this little one too, but in your life together as a family. It's just so exciting to see and, and to, to look ahead and to see, I wonder what God has planned. You know, I wonder what he has planned for each of these two little ones, but for you together as a family. And just to submit ourselves to that plan and say, God, lead us and guide us along that way and prayerfully follow him. Because you know now, having one, that being a parent's not an easy thing, right? And now you've got two, right? So it's doubly difficult. But to know that we're never alone, right? That God is there. He wants to lead us. He wants to guide us when we submit ourselves to him. That your family is here. That your church family is here too. That we do this together. And what a joy that is. And what a witness it is to the community around us as well. That's what it's all about, to bring God the glory. So we congratulate you. We're excited for you. I've got a gift for you as well here. Beginner's Bible. All right, I wrote a little verse inside. Now this is the eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. That's from John 17 Verse 3, the words of Jesus himself reminding us, what is the center of life all about? It's about knowing him. And that, through that, receiving the forgiveness of our sins and that sure and certain hope of eternal life. So I want to give that to you as you share those stories of Jesus and God's love in the lives of these two little ones. And uh, I know we want to bless you. And there's a special song that's going to be sung just about that in just a moment called The Blessing. But we want to pray for you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the many ways that you bless us. As a community of faith, to be sure, but individually as well. And as you've given this new blessing to Nate and Sherry, Father, we are just filled with joy for them. We pray that you be with them, that you continue to lead them and guide them along the way of, of parenthood. It's not always an easy journey. But Father, we know that with you and with our family and our church family, we're never alone, and we thank you for that. 
So Father, give Nate and Sherry the willingness to always look to you and to submit themselves to you and to follow you and to want to serve you with all that they are and to instill these values into these little ones too. And Father, that for your name's honor and glory and to honor the name of Jesus, our Savior. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Mitch has got a certificate for you as well. We don't want to forget that. Well, it is a wonderful opportunity for us this morning to be able to celebrate another sacrament. Uh, last Sunday morning, if you were with us, we had the opportunity to celebrate the sacrament of communion, and this morning, celebrating the sacrament of baptism. And that, of course, for little or not so little, I would say, uh, Abram Martin Petrulia, uh, the uh, latest addition for Nick and Whitney, and we're thrilled about that. Well, Nick and Whitney, since you are presenting Abram for this sacrament of baptism today, I'd like to invite you to stand right there and in front of God and his people to answer the following three questions. And it's okay if you've got your hands full, Nick. First of all, do you confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, accept the promises of God and affirm the truth of the Christian faith, which is proclaimed in the Bible, and confessed in this church of Christ? Second, do you, believe, do you believe that Abram, though sinful by nature, is received by God as a member of his covenant and therefore ought to be baptized? And finally, third, do you promise in reliance on the Holy Spirit and with the help of the Christian community to do all in your power to instruct Abram in the Christian faith and to lead him by your example to be a disciple of Christ. Nick and Whitney, how do you respond? Friends, I invite you to stand alongside of Nick and Whitney, and I have a question for us as the congregation, the body of Christ here at Grafskop. And following this question, the affirmative answer is, we do God helping us. Here's the question. Do you, the people of the Lord, promise to receive Abram in love, to pray for him, help instruct him in the faith, and encourage and sustain him in the fellowship of believers. Congregation, how do we respond? We do, God helping us. Thank you. Congregation, you may be seated. And Nick and Whitney, you can come on up with Garrett, of course. And Cal is uh, your household elder, I believe. So he's going to be up here with us as well. Sleeping? All right, we'll see if we stay sleeping. All right. Well, friends, our Lord said, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. Don't keep them back. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Abram, Martin, Petrulia, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Didn't quite stay sleeping, did we? No. Hey, we are so excited for the two of you. Just to see how God has blessed you, just to see how he's growing your family as well. It is so exciting. I know it's exciting for your family, for sure. But, you know, it's also exciting for us as a church family. And just to see in the ways that God is touching your lives as he's blessing you, as he's building this family. And then just to wonder, as, as I'm sure your family does, but as a church family as well, to wonder, what's God going to do? Right? How is he going to lead you guys as a family? How is he going to work in the lives of these two children that he's blessed you with? And that's exciting. Right? In a way, it's exciting not to know exactly what the future holds, but to know at the same time who holds that future. And that, of course is God himself and our Lord Jesus Christ. And to know that he walks with you every single step of the way, that you're never alone. Now, sometimes as parents, you're going to maybe feel like that. But his promise is secure. He's always there. And your family's there. Your church family also has stood up beside you and, and said, we promise we're going to walk this road with you. It's a big reason why Cal's up here too, as your elder. That's a reason why we want to support you. 
And I have a gift for you, well, particularly for Abram, uh, as, as he gets a little bit older and uh, both can hear these wonderful stories of God and the stories of Jesus. And I wrote a verse in here from John 17, verse 3. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's really what it comes down to. I know as parents, that is our number one desire for our children, that they come to know and to love and to live for the Lord through Jesus. So in just a moment, we're going to hear a song that kind of talks about that and a, a blessing song, right? Just to bless Abram, to bless you as a family. But right before we hear that song, we're going to pray. Cal also has a certificate for you. I certainly don't want to forget that. But we want to pray. We want to pray for you and then that song as a blessing. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for what we have been able to witness here today. This remarkable picture of your grace. We are so thankful. And Father, we, we pray for Nick and Whitney and their journey as parents with these two children you've given to them. Give them wisdom, God. Give them the humility to seek you and to follow you and to know that you are always there. We're so thankful for, uh, for our family and for our church family too. Father, we know we never do this alone. And mostly we know that you are always here. And we are so very thankful for that. We pray a blessing uh, into uh, the Petrullia's life and into their family and to the blessing of these children you've given to them. Lord, watch over them, care for them. And Father, lead them and guide them along your way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Congratulations to you. I think we're, we're all going to have a seat, and then Maddie is going to sing for us the blessing. Children, let children, may his favor be upon you. 
upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing God's people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you, man. Well, as we go to God uh, in prayer, just a couple of things that I want to highlight for us. Uh, last week at the later morning service, I announced that Kim Gates uh, was in the hospital and she had to have a heart cath and that happened, but everything was fine. Uh, in fact, there's no problem with the heart at all. So she's uh, very grateful for that. Just a medication issue that they're working out. Uh, Marsha Veltman had her surgery, the lumpectomy, and it went very, very well. Uh, very good report following that. She will have a little radiation treatment coming, but uh, is doing really well. Uh, Jen Veal uh, has another neck surgery on Tuesday of this week. Not quite as extensive as the earlier one some months ago, but still uh, be a little rehab and uh, recovery for her, so uh, pray for her too. And then also... Uh, Marion Scolton's uh, daughter, of course, Marsha's daughter, but Linda, Linda Wiemhoff, uh, who's been struggling with cancer for some time now. Um, the doctors have noted that that cancer has spread, and uh, part of that has gone to her spine. That's giving her a lot of uh, discomfort, and so she is going to have a procedure tomorrow uh, to relieve, uh, we trust, uh, some of the pain that she's been experiencing. Uh, so pray for Linda and the doctors, too, as they kind of determine what the next steps uh, may or may not be able to be uh, with, uh, with the cancer she's battling. So let's go to God in prayer together. Most merciful God and Heavenly Father, Lord, it is so good to be able to come before you in worship and in prayer. And Father, to sing our songs of praise to you and to celebrate your covenant faithfulness in this sacrament of baptism to see how you continue to be so very, very good to your people. Father, to remind ourselves again that you and you alone are worthy of our worship. We're so thankful, Father, for the freedom to be here, for the opportunity to be here, even in the midst of everything that's going on around us. And certainly, we continue to pray for that with respect to COVID-19 and all the many concerns that this raises not just for life in the church, but for life in general. Father, we pray for that, not only in our own nation, of course, but throughout the world at large, that very soon this would uh, be able uh, to come to an end, that a vaccine uh, would be found. Uh, Father, that could be widely distributed. Uh, Father, we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't have to worry about this anymore. We'd be able to get back to life as, as we were so used to it, life as normal, as we might say. Father, in the meantime, we pray that you would help us and surround us with your love and faithfulness. Uh, be with those who are ill. Father, well, those who are healthy, we pray that you would keep them healthy and strong too. Father, we thank you in a very special way today for your amazing grace. A grace that is so rich and free. A grace that is so undeserved. A grace that is so precious and a grace that is so needed in our lives. And Father, for the love that you shower into our lives too. 
for your constant presence, for that promise you give us that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us no matter what. We just praise you and we thank you that this is the God who you are. Father, we've heard today of some concerns uh, of those in our church family or connected with our church family, and we want to pray for them. We pray for Jen as she goes in for this uh, second neck surgery on Tuesday. We ask that that would go well for her. Father, be with the doctors. Help them do exactly what they need to do. And Father, that you would grant healing into Jen's life. And for Marcia, we're grateful for the successful surgery that she had. We pray as she recovers from that and looks towards some radiation treatments that you would keep her strong. And Father, ultimately, this cancer would be eradicated from her body. And for many others whom we're aware of who are, who are struggling or perhaps recovering or maybe receiving treatments of one kind or another. We think of Mark Brooker and Kim Gates and Russ Johnson and Alice Genzink and Pastor Bob and Pastor Jerry too. We pray for each one and others perhaps that we haven't mentioned specifically. But Father, their needs are there and you know them even better than, than we do. We pray that you would meet those needs as only you can do. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones today. And we think uh, most recently of a former member, uh, Ruth Bauman, who's died, and those who are mourning her loss, Mary for one, but others. We pray, Lord, that you would give comfort and peace. We pray for a variety of family members and friends who have special needs going on. Certainly we think of Linda, and the cancer that she's battling, and the procedure tomorrow. We pray that it goes well. For Mark Strabing, too, and the cancer he's battling, and also Tabitha Walters and her cancer. We're thankful to hear uh, good news from Chad Kreisinger and the cancer he's dealing with, that he's doing well and feeling good. We pray for that to continue. For Christy Mottman and the therapy she continues to receive, that it would go well. And for Bobby Brennan, too. And the need for a, a kidney, we pray, God, that you would provide. Father, truly the names that we've mentioned and the concerns that we've raised are really just the tip of the iceberg. But Father, we're grateful that you know our hearts. You're grateful that we know, that you know what we're going to ask for even before we ask it. And Father, your spirit brings our needs and concerns to your throne. And sometimes with words that, and groans that our words cannot express. We thank you for that. Father, we recognize as we look at the world around us, too, of those on the east coast of our nation who have experienced the, the hurricane and tropical storm and some of the devastation that's come uh, their way. We think, too, of those in Beirut, and this massive explosion. Many are, are injured, that some have died. Father, we pray for this world. We recognize, again, that this is your world. Father, we pray that you continue to to walk with us. We pray that you would lead us and guide us into your truth. We know that that is the ultimate answer, the truth of Jesus himself. So, Father, we look to you. We humble ourselves before your greatness. Father, we celebrate your love. And, Lord, we pray that in all that we do as your people, we would seek to love you above everything else and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Be with us in our continued worship today and in the worship time yet to come and a little bit later from now. Father, that your name would be lifted up and the name of Jesus would be exalted. In Jesus' name we pray and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Well, if you have brought your Bibles with you this morning, I'd like to invite you to take a moment and turn in them uh, to 1 Kings, there in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm going to be reading verses 17 through 39 in just a little bit. But if you want to turn there already and get uh, that all set to go, that would be great. If you don't have a Bible with you, don't worry. We'll put the uh, scripture reading on the screen in just uh, a moment when we get to that. Well, congregation, once again, uh, today, as we've been doing for the past number of weeks, we want to focus our attention on another familiar Old Testament character. 
they really come to understand another key quality of the Christian life. In other words, a quality that, that God wants to see cultivated in our hearts and lives uh, as those who belong to him. Now, I would, uh, I would suggest that the character that we want to take a look at today is going to be a familiar name to most of us. But at the same time, he's probably not someone we know a whole lot about. And I'm talking here about Elijah. Now, we may know, and I think we probably do know, most of us, that Elijah was one of God's prophets. And we might even remember a, a couple of stories from his life, uh, perhaps uh, stories that revolve primarily around uh, someone whom we know as the widow of Zarephath. You might remember that name, you might not, but you remember, I'm sure, that story of, of those jars of flour and oil that just miraculously never dried up. That was the widow of Zarephath, right? And also, this widow had a son who died, and Elijah, by God's power, raised him back to life. So maybe those are stories that we're familiar with when it comes to Elijah. And those are fascinating stories to be sure in and of themselves. And not to mention, of course, we remember that Elijah was the one who didn't die, but in fact he was taken up into heaven by way of what? A fiery chariot, right? We remember that. But the story that I want us to really think about today is this account of Elijah confronting Ahab and the prophets of Baal. Now, I want to back up for just a moment, kind of set the stage for us. Elijah lived right around the middle of the 9th century BC. He, he lived smack dab during the reign of King Ahab, who ruled over the northern kingdom of Israel from 874 to 853 BC. Now, you might remember, if you were here last week, you remember we talked about David. And I mentioned that David was the second king of the United Kingdom of Israel, all 12 tribes together. Well, it just so happened that after the reign of Solomon, David's son, that United Kingdom divided into two. And so now, when we catch up here in Elijah's time, we've got the northern kingdom of Israel with its ten tribes and the southern kingdom of Judah with its two tribes. Well, Ahab was the fourth king of the northern kingdom. Now, if you're familiar at all with Ahab, then you know that he was a very wicked king. In fact, as 1 Kings chapter 16 tells us, beginning at verse 30 there, it says, Ahab, son of Amri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. You get the picture, right? Ahab was a bad guy. And then when you throw Jezebel into the mix there, then the, the wickedness scale, it just kind of topples right on over. And so it goes without saying then that with Ahab and Jezebel in control that the religious climate there in Israel was in sad shape when it came to the knowledge and worship of the one true God. Right? The God who had, who had rescued his people from slavery in Egypt, the God had led, who had led his people into the promised land. God had been forgotten and he'd been forsaken. So it was into this context, it was into this situation that Elijah appears on the scene. And really from a biblical perspective, he just kind of pops up. He just kind of shows up out of nowhere right here in 1 Kings chapter 17. And we're not told a lot about him whatsoever. In fact, we're only told that he was a, a Tishbite, that he was from Tishbe in Gilead. You know, whatever we don't know about him, we do come to know one thing for certain from what Scripture shares with us, and that is that Elijah was a man of passion. That is to say, he had an all-out 
zeal for God. And perhaps nowhere does that come out more clearly than in the story recorded for us in 1 Kings chapter 18, our text for this morning. So I'm going to read verses 17 through, uh, through 39. Now we're kind of hopping in the middle of it, but I think we'll all catch on really quickly here. So 1 Kings 18, beginning at verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah... Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel. You have, and your father's house, because you've abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table." So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bowls be given to us, and let them choose one bowl for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I'll prepare the other bowl, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire... He is God. All the people answered, It's well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bowl and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bowl that was given them, and they prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made, and at noon Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or perhaps relieving himself, or he's on a journey. Maybe he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. As far as we're going to read in God's word this morning, and may He bless His word to us today. Elijah was a passionate person. 
I don't think there's really a, a better word to describe him. And when we're using that word passion, we mean very particularly that he had an incredible zeal for God. In other words, more than anything else, Elijah wanted the one true God to be known and worshipped as he deserved. And most certainly, this is another key characteristic of our Christian lives. You know, the question here to ask is, what does it take then? What does it take to have a passion like Elijah's? Maybe we think we can. Maybe we think that this is just something that's stuck in the Old Testament. It's only for Elijah. But I'm here to tell you it's not. So what does it take to have a passion like Elijah's? From this remarkable story, I think we can distill three distinct things. Three things that you and I need to do in order to cultivate, to give room for this passion to grow in our lives today. So first of all, Elijah reveals to us in this story that genuinely passionate people speak the truth. They speak the truth. In other words, when it comes to the the spiritual truth, and when I say truth throughout this message, as I refer to Elijah's passion and what it takes to be a passionate people, that's truth with a capital T. We're talking about biblical truth here. We're talking about Christian truth. So when it comes to this spiritual truth, genuinely passionate people honestly say the things that sometimes... People really don't want to hear. That's exactly what Elijah does right off the bat in our text with Ahab, doesn't he? Right, so here comes Elijah, and Ahab sees him, and the very first thing that Ahab says to him, it says, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Now, let me give you a little bit of background to that. Three and a half years earlier, God had told Elijah to to go to Ahab and tell him, that God was going to shut up the sky. There was going to be no rain for a number of years. Now, obviously, God was doing this because it was a punishment to Ahab for his wickedness and for leading Israel into all kinds of spiritual confusion. But Ahab refused to see it that way. He refused to see that it was his fault. Instead, he wanted to place the blame squarely on Elijah's shoulders. That's why he says, is this you, you troubler of Israel? Well, Elijah isn't about to let Ahab get away with that, and not merely for personal reasons, but even more so for the sake of the truth. And so as we read in verse 18, Elijah tells him straight out, it's not me, it's you, he says. It's not my wickedness, it's nothing I've done that's brought all this trouble on Israel. It's your unfaithfulness, it's your wickedness that has brought this trouble to Israel. And as we can imagine, this is not something that Ahab really wanted to hear. But Elijah knew that he needed to hear it. And so he told Ahab honestly, perhaps a little brashly we might say, but honestly nonetheless. And being a genuinely passionate person begins with speaking the truth, the spiritual truth with respect to God, right? Even, or or perhaps especially when people really don't want to hear it. And you know, that means very directly to you and I that when it comes to opportunities that God gives us, those doors, those windows of opportunities that he opens for us to share the gospel, that we need to share the gospel honestly. We need to tell people that you know what, just like me, you're a sinner and you need salvation. And furthermore, we have to tell him the only way of salvation is Jesus. He is the only name given to us under heaven by which we must be saved. It's only Jesus. You need to place your faith and your trust in him. Believe in him as your Savior and your Lord. Then and only then will your sins be forgiven. Then and only then will you be guaranteed to spend eternity with God. And you know what? There are many people around us today who don't want to hear it. They don't want to. 
Because they become stuck in this relativistic and humanistic way of thinking. That if there's a problem, I can fix it myself. Or you know what? Don't tell me there's only one way to God. Don't, don't preach that exclusivism to me. There's more ways to God than that. So in many ways, it's a truth that many around us really don't want to hear. But we need to speak that truth to them honestly. And if we say anything less than that, then we are not being honest with them according to biblical truth, the Christian truth that you and I have been blessed to know. Now, maybe we don't want to do it as brashly as Elijah did. Maybe we want to be a little more tactful about it. But we need to be honest. Genuinely passionate people speak the truth. If we really want to be those who want others to come to know and worship the one true God, this is where it starts. We need to speak the truth. Secondly, as Elijah reveals to us in this story, genuinely passionate people stand firm. In other words, they, they refuse to back down. They, they refuse to compromise when it comes to the truth that they're declaring, regardless of the situation. Right? I mean, look, look at Elijah's situation. As verse 22 tells us here, Elijah was the only prophet of God who was willing to stand up to Ahab and tell him the truth. Now, I think we do need to understand that Elijah wasn't the only faithful follower of God in Israel. Sometimes he felt that way. If we know anything about Elijah's life, sometimes he felt that way, but he wasn't. In fact, verse 4 of chapter 18, we didn't read that verse, but if you look back there, it tells us that there were at least 100 of those who were faithful in Israel to God. But Elijah, nevertheless, he's the only one willing to face Ahab, along with all of these prophets, the 450 prophets of Baal. I mean, the odds obviously were not in Elijah's favor, but he stood firm. In fact, there could have been 450,000 prophets of Baal, and it wouldn't have mattered to Elijah. He still would have stood firm. Nothing was going to make him compromise the truth that he was declaring. You see, genuinely passionate people begin by speaking the truth, no doubt, but it continues then by standing firm in that truth and for that truth, regardless of the situation. And that means that if we're really going to be people of passion, people who really do have that burning desire for others to come to know and to worship the one true God, then we need to be ready to stand our ground. We need to be ready to never compromise the truth that we're declaring, regardless Regardless of perhaps being made fun of. Regardless perhaps of being ridiculed. Regardless perhaps of being called a, a goody two-shoes at school. Right? Regardless of any criticism. Regardless of any harassment. Regardless even of any persecution that we may encounter. Truly passionate people don't back down from that truth. They stand firm. They never compromise the truth regardless of the situation. Then finally, as, as Elijah reveals to us in this story, genuinely passionate people seek the Lord. Right? So let's get the whole situation in our mind. Here's Elijah. He has, he has spoken the truth. He has stood firm for that truth. And now he finds himself in the, in the middle of a contest. Right? And the, and the rules to this are pretty simple, right? Each group, whether it's Elijah or whether it's these 450 prophets of Baal, they each build their altar. They put this cut up bull on top, a uh, uh, cow or bull on top. And then without any direct human intervention, that, that offering needs to be all burned up, right? So Elijah says, you guys go first. So the prophets of Baal have at it, right? They build their altar, put that cut up animal on top. They dance around, they sing, they're ecstatic. They do all of these things. Now, Elijah needles them even just a little bit, so they, they even start taking out the swords and the spears, and they slash themselves and all of these things, but there's nothing, not even a whisper from this so-called God 
Baal. So now it's Elijah's turn. And Elijah knows exactly what he has to do, and it has nothing to do with ecstatic dancing. It has nothing to do with sharp knives. So after he has this, this altar just doused with all of these jars of water, what does Elijah do? Elijah prays. He calls on the name of the Lord. Friends, this is such a key element when it comes to being the genuinely passionate people that God wants us to be. Right, that we need to understand that speaking the truth and standing firm for the truth isn't ultimately enough for people to come to acknowledge the truth. That finally, God has to act. You see, Elijah understood that. And that's exactly why he prayed. He knew that God needed to act. And did he ever? Can you imagine? Sending down fire from heaven, consuming not just that, that sacrifice, but the whole altar, all the water, everything, till there was nothing left. Boy, did God act. So too for us today. To be genuinely passionate people, we also need to seek God in prayer, and we need to ask Him to do what only He can do. I send the fire of His Spirit in order to open hearts and to transform lives. Only God can do that. And when I think of the passion that Elijah displayed, I can't help but think of Jesus and the perfect passion that he displayed. I mean, more than anything else, Jesus spoke the truth with a capital T. He spoke the truth. In fact, as the opening chapter of John reminds us, Jesus was truth incarnate. He was truth in the flesh. And no matter how he was questioned, no matter how he was challenged, no matter even how he was attacked, he never once compromised the truth that he was declaring, namely that he was the promised Messiah, that he was the only way of salvation. And on top of everything else, Jesus constantly prayed that his Father would be hard at work in the hearts and lives of all of those whom he came into contact with. May it be that by the power of the Spirit of Christ himself who lives within us, each one of us as believers, that we also would be people of passion, people who are willing, people who are even eager to speak the truth, to stand firm in that truth, and to seek the Lord, so that by God's amazing grace, that those in the world around us might come to know and to worship the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that not for our glory, but for God's glory and for the goal of his coming kingdom. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we read the story of Elijah recorded for us in your word. And sometimes we think to ourselves, that could have never been me. And it never can be. Such passion, such zeal, God, for you. But Lord, a big part of this story is to teach us what passion is about. And we see it so clearly. We've got to speak your truth, O oh God. We have to stand firm and never compromise that truth. And we certainly need to seek you and ask you to do what only you can do. This is what it is to be people of passion. 
Lord, help us not only to be willing to cultivate this passion in our lives, but to be eager to do it. So, Father, we pray for the movement and power of your Spirit within us. That more and more we might become the people you call us to be. For your glory and for the goal of your kingdom. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand. We're going to sing a couple of verses of this song, To God Be the Glory. Again, let's stand as we sing. going to close with singing verse 3 of that same song. Right before uh, we do, just to remind you as you exit today to your right, will be a couple of opportunities to give. Uh, one offering for the general fund here and the other for Teen Challenge. Uh, so recognize that uh, as you leave, if you would. And uh, before we do close uh, with verse 3, God wants to give us his parting blessing. Receive that blessing now. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Oh